soon I moved it. All right. Well, hey, everybody. It's Eric alongside Rod here to speak to our new friend, Trevor Mueller, who is the host of the Fourth and Inches podcast covering the Washington Husky football and basketball programs. You can find him over on uh, Twitter, formerly X, or X, formerly Twitter, at Trevor Mueller SI. Uh, thanks so much, Trevor, for joining us in the Final Four. It's not in the schedule. Yeah, thanks for having me. Looking forward to uh, Big Ten basketball, Big Ten football, Big Ten everything. Yeah, well, so that's <laughs> we've been doing our tour up the West Coast, getting to know a little bit more about Big Ten country, you know, Southern California, Puget Sound. Uh, so help us out a little bit here. What do you what do you and the fan base think about the end of the pack eight, 10, 12, now joining the Big Ten or 18 or whatever it's called now? Uh, it's a necessary evil. It's one of those things I grew up in the Pac-10, uh, watched the Pac-12, watched the Pac-10 almost become the Pac-16, but the Longhorn Network was the the big thing that stopped that, <laughs> you know, first super conference back when the Pac-12 was there when, you know, you're thinking you're going to get Texas and Oklahoma and the consolation prize is Utah and Colorado. It's a kind of a deflating feeling. So. <laughs> That that was a tough pill to swallow. I got really used to the Pac-12. Uh, I know the programs in and out. Uh, the idea of not playing, you know, Oregon State and uh, Arizona schools at home. We don't like going to Arizona. A lot of bad things happen in that state to Washington. Um, <laughs> but for the most part, you know, it's it's a really sad end of an era. But it's actually it's also at the same time a really exciting time being at the forefront of college sports, joining a, a program, uh, you know, a, a conference with some big time story programs that you think of like Rose bowl games all the time. Right, right. Right. You think of Michigan and Washington, USC, Ohio state, Oregon, Wisconsin, UCLA in there a little bit, Penn state. Um, there's just a lot of really cool, uh, it's going to feel like bowl game season for a few years until we get used to this new thing. Yeah. Well, it, and for Washington, it's a little bit different than the other schools that you've lost your rival, right? Like Washington state's left behind in the pack two or whatever, the, what yeah. the, whatever they're called now, whatever they'll end up. Yeah. Uh, how do, I mean, I, I suppose Washington state feels a, a lot differently about that than Washington does because, you know, they were the, obviously the stepchild that was left behind. Yeah. Does do Washington fans care? Or are they still going to try and play each other or in, basketball at least or football so there's still uh for the next few years they're gonna play uh home and home this next one next year is gonna be uh i think it's called lumen field now where the seahawks play um which i think is a benefit to both programs especially washington state where a lot of their alumni base is over in seattle it's not a good feeling between the two and, and to top all of that off after everything that happened with Washington being left behind some litigation uh, around the state, Washington loses its athletic director, Troy Dan into Nebraska and goes out and hires Pat Chung, who was at Washington state. So it felt like the rich getting richer and kind of taken from <laughs> the sisters of the poor. So not a lot of good feelings. Uh, I feel bad for my Coug friends. Um, I got a lot of really close friends that are Washington state fans and they just kind of like Oregon state. I got ties to Oregon state. My brother-in-law is a professor there uh, just continues to take it on the chin for about 12 straight months. Yeah. It's yeah. It's I mean, we, yeah. we were, you know, Michigan state was part of that, obviously hiring Jonathan Smith, Jonathan yeah. Smith away from Oregon state. So um, <laughs> turning to, to Washington and, and trying to get a better feel for it as a program for our listeners. I think most big 10 fans, when you think of Washington, first and foremost, you think of it as a football school, obviously, right? Like I'll date myself for me. The first name that comes to my mind when I think about Washington is Don James. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as you were saying, there's a, a long tradition. Washington's been, Ah, you could probably make an argument other than USC, the most successful school in terms of football tradition in that league, right? Um, but there have been some periods of basketball success. Uh, you know, I, I again, I'll date myself. I think the only time in my lifetime that Michigan State has played Washington in basketball was in the 1986 NCAA tournament 
um, Christian, I think it was the year after Detlef Schrempf had left, but they still had Christian Velt and mm-hmm. a Scott Skiles led Michigan State team beat them in the first round of the tournament. I don't remember another meeting. I may be missing one, but there's not a lot of basketball um, tradition between our school and yours. But I wanted you to talk about where basketball sits in the overall athletic department firmament at Washington. Where does it fit in the culture of the school? It's one of those really hard things to quantify because you look at the NBA and you see Seattle and Tacoma players littered throughout. That's um, going to be one of our next question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you guys in the big 10, I mean, it's, I know it's the rival school, but you know, Michigan taking uh, uh, Jamal Crawford back in, sure. the, in the late nineties, sure. right. Coming into Seattle and, and taking him away. And, you know, he, he's one of those guys. I remember reading something about him where he never, he always went on Pacific time, even when he was over uh, in other time zones around <laughs> the league, he always thought in Pacific time zone. Um, there's been pockets of great, right? You have the deaf left shrimp and that kind of quick era where, uh, where they made some noise. Uh, you can go back a little bit farther. Uh, there was a couple of runs. They've never been to the final four. Uh, the Lorenzo Romar era was a really exciting era in the um, in the early 2000s and into the mid 2000s and in the 2010s, um, and the 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 I don't know what you want the spoon that stirred the drink with that was local guys staying home. So you mm-hmm. think of that first round. You have um, Nate Robinson was one yep. of those guys. He was sure. a local. Um, you have the Brandon Roy, which those two kind of, you know, they, they were together at the time where, you know, Nate was, was, uh, kind of the, the primary scorer, uh, in the early, you know, 2003, 2004. And then, uh, you know, Brandon Roy went from a second round draft pick to his senior year of being a, a lottery pick and right. some of the other local guys that were around them, uh, made that a really exciting time where heck ed the uh the arena where they play their games uh was uh on fire and it was the premier program it also happened to kind of coincide with a really dark time in washington football so yeah washington basketball was the focal point for that very short amount of time lorenzo romar continued to have a pretty he was a great recruiter and he was a really good person uh, so he ha- he continued to get really good um, recruiting classes, and I think that kept him around for a while, even when the product on the on the court wasn't uh, generating wins. Like yeah. there was some unbelievable stat where you know he was putting first round draft picks into the league every year. It was Washington, uh, Kentucky, and Duke, and the only one that wasn't making the tournament was Washington during that time. So uh, a really fun decade with Romar that kind of petered out. And then he was able to, uh, uh, Mike Hopkins came in from Syracuse. He was the coach in waiting right. uh, there. Uh, he was able to use Romar's guys in a way that was so innovative. And it really centered around Matisse Thibel. And I don't know if you guys know that name. He's, he's with the Blazers now. Mm-hmm. Um, he, uh, he made the, that two, three zone work because of how good he was playing the passing lanes. Basically he was, given free reign to lock down one sign and gamble. And uh, he, he goes down in history now as uh, the top steel getter in uh pack 10 pack eight pack 10, 12 uh, basketball history. Yeah. So, um, and, and, and again, the, the good vibes were up again and people were there. He was buying pizzas for the student section and then um, when that recruiting, that final recruiting class graduated out, uh, he just hasn't been able to make the tournament again. And and now they're kind of back to being behind softball, uh, behind football, obviously. And, uh, uh, you know, there's some, there's some feeling that Danny Sprinkle is going to bring a lot of that back because there is a really solid fan base here, but when you're not winning, they're just not going to come. Yeah. yeah. And that, and that's kind of what I wanted to to get at specifically, you know, coming with your school, coming into the big 10, you do have a, a range in the league in terms of 
where basketball sits. So at a place like Indiana, it's yeah. obviously the show, you know, mm-hmm. um, arguably Purdue as well. Um, yeah. Michigan state is actually one of the few places that I think yep. is a football first school where basketball actually does sit at more or less an equal place at the table. Yep. And then you have places like Michigan and Ohio state, which have a lot of basketball success, but basketball is very clearly the second, uh, the second tier option and, and people will care if the program is having a good year. If they're not, as our, our friends down the road can attest to this year, <laughs> they don't show, they don't, they don't tend to show always, even when they're winning, but that's no, another yeah. issue. Yeah. Um, so that's what I was trying to get at. And it seems like you're you're telling us that, you know, there's potential in the Washington fan base, but that it's not a school where, where basketball has been such a deep seated passion that people will show up in large numbers, even if they're struggling, it's, it's kind of a, you got to win first and then they'll get on board sort of place. Is that, is that accurate? That's a hundred percent accurate. And it, okay. You you can think of it just like those other schools that you mentioned. It's yeah. The big 10 didn't bring Washington in because of their, their basketball program. That's going to, you know, the big 12 kind of got a lot of those basketball programs. <laughs> yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah, but you guys, you know, we got UCLA, and that's uh, that's a sleeping giant when it's. Uh... Oh, absolutely. We we just had a guest from UCLA on. We uh we recorded with the other day, and so we spent a lot of time talking about that tradition and yeah. what the sport means at that school and everything. But yeah, that that sort of you you you've you've articulated what I what I thought was the case in terms of where basketball sits at at Washington. So yeah. um. Yeah. Anyway, Eric. Yeah. Well, you know, before we get to the next question, you know, I was growing up in Lansing. We'd always talk about how it was super cloudy. And that's why actually it's really great that Washington is now part of the Big Ten, because I, the line always was, you know, Lansing's the third cloudiest city in the country behind Seattle and Tacoma. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you, so you guys are very appropriate. You'll feel very much at home in East Lansing if you come. Yeah. Love that. Uh, <laughs> and of course, with those clouds comes rain and with rain comes water on your roof. And so that's why you want to contact the brothers who just you got, who just you gutters to take care of the water off your your roof. Make sure you say those gutters are functioning well. Uh, make sure that they can repair them, they replace them, they can clean them out, put light leaf guards on, whatever you need. Uh doesn't matter. They can do residential and commercial. They do a fantastic job on both the east side and the west side of the state. You can find their contact information at our support page at tiffnots.com slash support. They get 10% off if you mention final four when you get your estimate. Uh, and so, you know, you mentioned the Seattle with the recruiting. And so that's, we've, we've had this same discussion really with about Minneapolis has had really great recruits and great basketball players and the university of Minnesota, which is based, you know, in Minneapolis yeah. has really struggled to maintain and hang on to those players. And they end up everywhere else, Michigan state amongst many of them. And it sounds like that's the same problem in Washington. Is that something that it, is that like a focus for the new coach coming in or is this going to be, do you think it's something, I guess that it, they can be successful in, in holding on to local talent in, in Washington? That's going to be the test of, of Danny Sprinkle and his coaching staff. One of the interesting things about the failure of Mike Hopkins was he was able to bring some high level recruits over from the East coast with him at the beginning. Isaiah Stewart was one of oh. them. We know that um, one. <laughs> Michigan yeah. State was very deep in that recruitment. Oh, okay, yeah. So you know, and and they struggled that year. He was there. They struggled. Uh, I don't know if they won a game after November. It was it was brutal. Um, uh, Will Conroy is a name that you guys probably don't know. He was a really good point guard, distributing guard on those uh, on those Washington teams in the early two thousands. That's been a uh, a staple assistant coach that's really recruited the area well. Uh, he's He wasn't retained by the program. He's now down at USC. So uh, I'm wondering what that relationship is going to be like there. Uh, for a while, you know, it was Louisville kept taking our guys. Peyton Siva, I don't remember if you remember that name. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, he was a Seattle kid that went and won national championship with the uh, with the Cardinals there. Um th- the 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 answer is I don't know, but if they're going to be yeah. successful, they're going to have to recruit uh, the Pacific Northwest. 
Yeah, and I mean, we, it, again, Eric mentioned uh, Minneapolis is, I think, a pretty good corollary for this because yeah. we've we've been talking about it for years that if Minnesota is going to succeed as a program, they don't have to get every kid because the the state produces enough high level players that um, you don't have to get everyone, but you got to get your share, and they haven't been getting their share. You know, Gonzaga. Yeah has beaten them for Minneapolis, big time Minneapolis yep. kids, Suggs, <laughs> Suggs and, um, and Chet in recent yep. years. Seattle strikes me as the same way. Um, Banchero was a Seattle kid who ended up at Duke, correct? Not only did he end up at Duke, but he, he was a Seattle, he, he wore purple to the, uh, to the draft. If Washington had any semblance of, uh, a successful program he would have stayed and right. and so that is the the recipe is you got to convince a couple of guys that they're going to be the one that turns the program around right and when you're somebody like ben carroll you could have but you can also protect yourself as the number one pick and go to a place where you're going to be sure every week right i don't blame him sure at all. no no i i get it and, and i mean i go back there was a kid um, didn't end up panning out, I think, to the level that was expected, but I can remember, um, God, it's probably at least a decade ago now, Josh Smith, who was a, a very highly touted big man. And I think he went to UCLA. Um, yep. and there've been lots and lots of examples of this, as you mentioned, kids who have gone to Louisville, ba basically at most other places, except UW. Yep. So, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. I, I, I wanted to go back to mike hopkins for a second since that era has just ended you know seven years in the job he only had the one tournament bid and as you say it was it came early and it was it was primarily with lorenzo romar's guys right yep um so even after that though i mean you you talked about isaiah stewart he he had some talent on those teams. I think about the team this year he had, there was another kid. He was obviously a transfer, but there was another kid. Michigan state had a deep recruiting relationship with Keon Brooks, um, who was from Indiana. He was mm -hmm. a very good player. Um, they had the Wheeler kid from Kentucky this year, right? Yep. As a point guard. So it, you can't say that Hopkins just never had players. He had some talent, mm -hmm. never managed to put it all together. So outside of the, you know, didn't keep enough of the hometown guys home element. What do you think went wrong? I mean, he came from Syracuse that comes with some stylistic elements that are mm -hmm. unusual in today's game. Do you, do you think the zone ended up being a problem? Was there, were there motivational problems, X and O problems, little of all of it? Why do you think that that era didn't end up working? So I'm going to try not to get too nerdy on this basketball. Uh, we get pretty nerdy in ours, so don't okay, worry. Okay, fantastic. So I'm, <laughs> and I am. Yeah. So um, the zone worked because uh, Matisse Thibel took away a side, right? Right. And um, after, after he graduated, um, they brought in a couple of guys. I, I think of Eric Stevenson from um, uh, West Virginia. He was another local kid that came home. You go from a really athletic six seven guy up top to like a six three um shooter to to be that other side of the two three zone and it just Oh yeah, that's that's a problem because Syracuse's teams have largely relied on good length all the, way, all the way around. Length that sometimes didn't necessarily transfer to the NBA. Right. Um, right. You know, right. you look at a lot of the those they always were in the tournament, but you know, you you could count there wasn't a ton of them that outside of Carmelo Anthony, of course. Um, but the, the defense, you know, he started to move away from the two, three zone. And when you're, you know, a, a, a Bayheim disciple and you move away from the thing that made them successful you for years. And, and I would argue that the new game is kind of moving away from that. And I, I don't think that's super yeah. controversial. Um, Not at all. Not at all. No, but, what Syracuse was so success successful doing when Hopkins was there was, was that defense. They were never great an, of an offensive team. The only time that he won the national championship is when he had, you know, a generational scorer on his team. Right. right. So the offense that 
uh, that Hopkins ran. And then uh, you go to his his staff. They had a, a guy with the last name of Wycliffe who had been fired from Cal, a defensive guy. Um, he had Quincy Pondexter at the end, who's a former player that uh, I remember um, him. Sure. Yeah, player development. And then um, and then you have Conroy, who was a, a great recruiter and a, and a really good facilitator in his time. The offense was so predicated on Keon Brooks having big nights. And uh, it was it was Wheeler driving uh, and kicking to shooters. And then uh, Keon Brooks going one on one a lot. And the problem with that style is is Wheeler tended to uh, to turn the ball over down the stretch. Um, Brooks had to be superhuman every night. And before him, it was a guy named Andrew Andrews. And then there was a guy named Terrence Brown, uh, the Terrence Brown Jr., who also filled that one on one playmaker role. So there were times where they, you know, they beat Kansas at Kansas. They, uh, they beat, um, they, they beat Arizona, uh, a, a time or two, they would win big games, but when you're relying on something that's not sustainable, yeah. uh, like with, you know, ball movement, right. right. Um, teams were able to key on, in on that late in games. And we, you'd see Washington up eight with three minutes left and go on a, a two and a half minute, drought uh, uh with with you know no shots made um <clears throat> talking to some of the former players that was by design where uh outside of a couple of those players they were very very specific in where they wanted them to operate and um i think it actually hurt some of the, the offensive development of of players that came through the hopkins uh system you have a guy like noah dickerson who uh, had a really good back to the ba- uh, uh, back to the basket game um, who could get out to the uh, about 15 feet. When Hopkins got there, his foot had to be in the key at all times. Uh, a lot of those lengthy guys, he expected them to be in the corners all the time, uh, which is great for a catch and shoot. But if you're not a catch and shoot kind of a guy, yeah. then um, you basically are double teamed with the baseline there. It just wasn't a sustainable offense and you saw them go on long long droughts and um basically waiting to be bailed out by a a one-on-one play like a brooks or whoever else uh in the seven years he was there right i'm curious um there was a guy we spent a lot of time talking about on our podcast who played at Rutgers, paul mulcahy Mm -hmm. what happened what happened with him this year because he was i i can tell was he hurt yeah he got hurt uh, at the beginning of the year. Okay. Yeah. Did he, he end he, up, did he end okay, up playing right. at all? Yeah. He started the season. Um, and, uh, he was, a, he, he was like, uh, um, a major distributor as well. Right. Like he, Oh yeah. Pretty much. Like, yeah. Right. Gigantic, the, gigantic pain in the ass to play against. I really. could imagine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He had some sort of lower, lower injury and then he wasn't necessarily, there was another guy that came in, uh, with the last name of Woods, that was a shooter that uh, I think took a bunch of those minutes. Okay, uh, but yeah, it was he got off to a really good start, and then after the injury, it just it it wasn't never. Gotcha. Yeah, because yeah, I I I really it was a weird one from our perspective. He did he was so much a part of Rutgers program, and it was right. it seemed like it was one of these things we're seeing a lot these days, where it's not even a kid is unhappy. It's just that there's a there's a better paycheck Yo, in another sure. place. And that's what it seemed like. It, it seemed a strange move from the beginning. And then I, I didn't keep my eye on it too closely. I just knew that he hadn't had – I knew Keon Brooks had had a very successful season statistically, but I, I mm-hmm. hadn't heard much about him, so I was curious. Yeah, I totally forgot about him because, yeah, we were puzzled on how that happened. Our assumption was there wasn't great NIL money at Washington basketball, but I guess – well, there's really there's really not great NIL money at Rutgers, right? Actually. I think yeah, Rutgers you have to actually you pay the players pay Rutgers to play yeah. there. I think it's, <laughs> yeah, it's and, right and, and it and it's weird and it shows you how how different how stratified the game has become because there's still an NIL issue at Rutgers. They they've lost guys from from the team last year yeah. who have moved on, uh, but yet they've also got two of the top five high school players in America coming in next year. So I think it, mm-hmm. that one really illustrates 
Yeah, the NIL story is primarily about kids who have a collegiate track record. That's where you're seeing the big dollar amounts. It's not so much even for McDonald's All Americans mm -hmm. um, as it is, you know, a hundred Dickers Dickinson or a uh, AJ Store, where they're they're getting the or the kid from Arizona Ballo, where they're mm -hmm. getting you know near high six figure, maybe even near seven figure um, numbers to, to transfer somewhere. That's not typically happening for the high school kids. So yeah. yeah definitely, um, definitely see that with the, uh, football players getting, you know, seven, three, two, three million dollars to play at Alabama or something like that. Well, we, um, we just had a kid two days ago at Michigan state, a defensive tackle who reportedly was the highest paid. And this is such a strange thing to be saying about a college player but we're, we're getting used to it was the highest paid defensive tackle in the big 10 and he hit the portal yeah. <laughs> so presumably somebody's willing to pay him even more than whatever the highest rate was in the conference yeah uh, i just well, looked it up uh it looked like he got nicked up a little bit he was averaging about 20 minutes a game and okay. uh, i think two ball heavy guys like wheeler and him that just kind of worked itself out. I don't know if the fit yeah. is necessarily fantastic. And that, it kind of that's a, well, you never know. That's yeah. a good that's a good point because Mulcahy at Rutgers really was um at the center of the wheel. Mm -hmm. He was he was their playmaker. He was the guy that the ball got run through. And and he was a really, I mean, really became an effective all around player. So I was I was a little bit surprised that I hadn't been hearing as much about him. But it, it sounds like the combination of some health issues and then, as you say, having two ball dominant guys when there's really only room for one, yeah. um, is what held him down. Yeah, well, it's important having good fit. And you know where else is good have place to have a good fit, Rod? It's Nudge Printing. Nudge Printing can pro provide all your Spartan apparel. Uh, you can uh, get your hoodies, T-shirts, whatever it is, uh, not only Michigan State, but also other schools, not only like Texas State, Indiana even, and all the other schools in the state of Michigan outside of the University of Michigan, where Gabe and Brittany won't touch that school with a 10-foot pole. Uh, so head on over to Nudge Printing, nudgeprinting.com, 20% off you, type in Final Four, just one word into the coupon code. And uh, that brings us to the next question. And we've talked about you know the previous regimes in Washington. So sprinkles coming in aside from having a great name and probably sponsorship with the donut shop. <laughs> uh, what do you see with him and how are things going so far now? This is when it's since the portal's technically open. <laughs> we always have to make these caveats. I'm not sure when this is going to release. So probably in a week or two. So it's what April 24th as we're saying this. So whatever said, you know, it's possible the entire lineup, the entire uh, roster has changed over by the time we talk about, you, you've listened to this, but anyway, talk to us about Danny Sprinkle, what they're hoping to get and uh, how things are going for him so far. So first off, the cool thing about Danny Sprinkle is he grew up in the area. He's a big Husky fan. This was the place he wanted to be. Uh, there was great. rumors about him before uh, the NCAA tournament started. And then Troy Dan and the, our athletic director takes off after about six months being on the job. And <laughs> one of the conversations through the, my, my friends in the the podcast that we do um, the guys at real dog, like what is this going to do to the possibility of sprinkle, you know, going elsewhere? Cause he's, right. he's, he's, he's been a hot name. He's been at Utah state for like two years and he's been uh, had a ton of success in a mountain West. Yep. It's been dominated by some other teams. And um, yeah, th three straight tournament bids between yeah. the two schools. Yeah. Yep. And, and yeah. And what he did at Montana state, I mean, yep. what a, what a great, uh, and, and of course it didn't matter. He wanted to, he wanted to come coach at Washington. So, uh, the, the wheels were in motion when the Dan and stuff went down to, uh, make sure that they were able to lock him down. Um, yeah, this is exactly what Husky fans needed. They needed we went the, uh, you know, Lorenzo Romar was a resounding success until he wasn't right. He brought uh, a lot of, uh, one of the more sustained, probably the most sustained uh, winning culture at Washington, watched it peter out, uh, saw the excitement with Hopkins, watched that peter out. And so Washington fans were really not interested in another highly thought of assistant coach. Um, yeah. They wanted 
and part of it is the excitement of like watching the NCAA tournament and watching, you know, Andy Enfield is like the one that I think of the most where he was at Florida Gulf coast and they're dunking all over the place, going to the sweet 16. And then he ends up at USC and uh, the excitement around that for a few years. Right. It's not that we right. wanted to flash in the pan, but we wanted somebody who has a proven track record of winning at other programs yeah. and not, you know, an assistant coach. So uh, that is the, uh, the the first domino, if you will, of uh, the excitement around Danny Sprinkle. Um, a couple of his guys are in the portal right now. The the one that is coveted by Husky fans and pretty much anybody else around college basketball is great. Osborne. He was the Mountain sure. West Player of the Year. Um, I was just in preparation for this. He's uh, headed to Kentucky today. So, um, I, on a visit, there's nothing, nothing for sure. So we'll see what, uh, you know, life after Calipari holds for Kentucky. But, <laughs> um, you know, he would be a great one. They just got, a Butler guard, uh, I'm spacing on his name right now. He just committed like a few minutes before I came on this podcast. Oh, um, they, they got a, another guard yesterday. So, um, uh, DJ Davis uh, was the one. That okay. Was, yeah. yeah. We, pl- we played them this year. So yeah. So familiar with him. That's a good ad. Oh, great. Yeah. It's a, he averaged like 13 a game last year. I, I don't really yep. know. And then uh, the other one, it was yesterday uh, point guard, Jace Butler. Yep. Uh, he was, uh, he, but he was a, he's a freshman. I think he was previously committed to Illinois. Right. Okay. Yeah. So those were the two, those are the two, uh, first commitments. The biggest thing that, you know, Husky fans thought would be, uh, important for Sprinkle to do when he got here was to recruit Corian Johnson to stay. He's a local kid, sixth man of the year in the pack 12. He averaged like 11 a game, but really it was the second half of the year where he was averaging close to 20 points a game. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, really a somebody that was able to come in and play alongside Brooks uh, and, and be a reliable scorer. He of course is headed to Louisville. So uh, that was kind of a shot to the gut, but you know, these two commitments and you know, the hope of Osborne coming here uh, is kind of where we're at. Braxton Mia, another center uh, showed flashes of being pretty good. Hasn't been able to put together a full season yet. Uh, He's in the transfer portal now. So you know, I, I think it's a wait and see on what the roster looks like, um, you know, more towards, you know, the end of the, uh, you know, getting close to the season of, of what they're actually going to look like. But um, vibes couldn't be worse before. So uh, <laughs> when you're at rock bottom, it, it feels pretty good to start moving in the right direction. Yeah. And so I, I want to touch on some of what you were just getting at. Obviously, you're in a situation like his. It's it, it's maybe a little bit akin to what uh, Dusty May is is having to do at Michigan, where um, yes. he's he's got no choice but to go deep into the portal for the first year. He's mm-hmm. going to probably end up with, I don't know, it's probably going to end up being seven or eight transfers, most least, likely yeah. on that roster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that that can be a short term thing, or it can be the way you want to run your program. Somebody like Jerome Tain at Kansas State, it's that's just kind of become a way of life right. at that program. Um, do you do you sense that is there a desire on Sprinkle's part to try long term to build with kind of the old fashioned way, high school recruiting being the emphasis and develop a you know, developmental program, or do you get the sense that he's more likely to live in the portal or, or a combination thereof? So I think that he's going to really go the route that he did, uh, you know, at Montana state specifically where um, he developed that program and then brought in some uh, really interesting. uh, Raekwon battle was a Washington uh, shooting guard who shot the lights out, but you know, was, wasn't necessarily on the, on the court a ton. He was, he was a true freshman uh, and he goes to uh, Montana State, develops, and then ends up at West Virginia. And so um, I think you're going to see a combination. You have to – it has to – he's going to start with with high school recruiting 
and then fill the roster uh, with those guys that presumably right. would put them over the top in now just an impossibly tough conference. So would you, obviously the, it sounds from the tenor of our discussion that one of the things there's a hope for him on Husky fans is that he does a better job at being able to keep the elite talent from the area at home. But do you view Sprinkle as a guy who maybe has a strength in talent identification? I mean, succeeding at the places he's coached at, particularly Montana State, that almost has to be part of the equation, right? You're not you're not getting guys that the big boys want. So do you do you sense that he's going to stick with that model to some extent, or or is it, hey, I'm at a I'm at a Big Ten school now. I can go after top 100 guys and it's going to shift that way. I think he's going, you, whatever kind of coach you are, you're going to stick to that to identity yeah, as yeah. a way that's going to help you as you transition to a bigger program. So, well, the you know, successful, been, the successful ones do for sure. I, and, I've seen guys, I've seen guys who get outside of that and it doesn't work. And that's kind of why I'm asking what your sense is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it. And that's the great point right there. It's let's hope he sticks to that because good coaching at with how much people are going to be moving around. Um, you have to have that um, foundational set almost as a teacher and a developer um, yep. because, you know, the, the, you can say that Calipari was successful, but like, I mean, look at, look at the last few years, the, get a bunch of freshmen and win doesn't work. Um, yeah. I I think that if the sense that I get is that he's going to continue to be that developer that uses the portal to basically like a, almost like a finishing uh, of a roster where right. you identify the guys that you want. Um, he's going to have to go after those top 100 guys because, you know, if you can get those guys, it, it can really help your program. But I think the foundation of uh, getting those, finding those guys, I mean, that's what Washington football did. They found the guys that were uh, high-level three-star guys in tournament and NFL players. Um, yep. Yeah. It's the opposite of what Lorenzo Romer did, where he'd get top 100 guys um, and let them be athletes for a year and then send them off to the NBA. So right. you, you have to, if he's going to be successful, he has to be able to develop because you can't, you can't run a program the way that you did even 10 years ago. You have to be able yeah. to develop and um, keep some of those guys around knowing that you're going to lose some guys. So that means you have to develop everybody. Well, we at 99% of the schools in the country, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, we have a program that we follow that actually does seem to be trying to do it the way it was done 10 years ago. And yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of consternation in the fan base about Tom Mizzo and um, portal activity or lack thereof. Now they just added a kid yesterday, so it's not nothing. It's never been nothing, but I think his approach has been very much along the lines of what you just described. You think sprinkle will gravitate toward except that he's, he's been able to get highly rated recruits who mm -hmm. tend to stick around. Yeah. They don't tend to be one year guys in the Michigan state program. So it, it'll be interesting to see how it goes uh, just to, to kind of put a bow on the Danny Sprinkle talk. I'm curious. Um, Cause I don't know a lot about him other than the fact that he's had a, a good deal of success leading into taking this job. Um, stylistically, what are you expecting Washington basketball to look like at, at both ends? Do you have a sense of style of play that's likely to happen? You know, I, I really don't. I, I, Danny Sprinkle has been one of those guys that were kind of on, on my radar, uh, a little bit later. And so, uh, you know, outside of a big man winning the, uh, the player of the year, uh, Jackson Grant is a guy that was a four-star kid up from Washington that ended up there. Uh, it looks like he puts a premium on the big man, but I really okay. don't have a ton to say about the schematics of him yet. Yeah, as to whether like he's a, a guy who wants to play up tempo right. basketball. That's that's always the cliche. Almost mm -hmm. almost every coach who comes into the Big Ten, it seems, wants to talk in their opening press conference about how they want to run and, and they want to press. And then they find out that it doesn't play. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, I'm so. I'm thinking about the best teams in that league and uh uh that's not necessarily how they uh 
how the Big Ten play. That's it's a well, it's yeah, a and, and and Michigan State likes to play up tempo offensively. You know, running has always been emphasized, mm -hmm. but but pressure basketball in this league, I can't count the number of coaches who have come into this league and for the first they talk about that and the first year you see them trying to press and they get shredded because the guard play and the coaching is too good mm -hmm. to get away with that. And then, they, you know, Brad Underwood's a great example of this. He pressed ridiculously his first year at Illinois to the point that everything they gave up was either a layup or an open three. That was it. And, 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 and they would, they would force maybe 20 turnovers, but you'd shoot 60% from the floor against them. Um, and, and he gave it up after a year, he figured out, well, I can't win this way. Um, so I was curious, but it doesn't sound like that's really been identified yet in terms of what, what sprinkle was likely to bring other than the fact that they're probably not going to run much matchup zone. We can, <laughs> that's what we I was just going to say. That. As long as they're not in the two, three, I think everybody's going to be happy. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Uh, so, so one final question uh, with um, what we have is since we're here in Michigan, it's, it's easy for us to forget that we have Tom Izzo in the sense that we don't recognize the perception of the program outside of like, yeah, we play in the champions classic, you know, against Duke, uh, Kentucky, Kansas every year. What is the perception that you have and that, you know, towards joining the big 10 and bat from a basketball standpoint, not taking football, so basketball yeah, of Michigan state of Tom Izzo and, like, is there fear? Is there, what is, what sort of, what sort of, I guess, impression do you have of the program from, from outside? Well, I mean, Tom, the Tom Izzo, just the name holds uh, so much weight to it because of all of the wins over the years, all of the time, you know, he's a staple in the NCAA tournament. Um, the question marks around uh, the, tr the, the way that, college basketball is trending. Is he going to, uh, is he going to adapt or is he going to, is he going to be successful in kind of the way that he runs things? Um, he, he's one of those, I mean, from a guy who's barely watched, uh, you know, I'm, I've never watched Washington match up against a Michigan state, but watching them in big games and seeing, uh, the physicality of a Michigan state team, um, I'm excited to see it, you know, at least <laughs> once or twice a year. Uh, I have a ton of respect for him. I think that his teams are so stubbornly physical uh, that even when there's not necessarily the, you know, a, a top, a top two, two, three class, um, they're still competing. Um the other part of the question was Washington. Just, coming a, just the Michigan State in general. Yeah. I mean, like, I guess, you know, just the program. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just one of the, it's one of the, it's a top 10 program in my, from in my entire lifetime. Right. Yeah. Like, I suppose. It just yeah. always You're been a young good. guy. <laughs> yeah. I am a young guy. <laughs> so uh, I remember, uh, you know, uh, one of my, actually, this, one of my favorite Michigan State players is Mateen Cleaves. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Ours too. <laughs> former supersonic. He was, uh, that's right. That's right. right. Yeah. 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 A after, after his stint with the Pistons. Yeah. That's right. So, um, yeah, I, I think, and then, you know, Washington coming into that conference where you have Michigan state, where you have Purdue, um, Indiana basketball right. first schools, man, you know, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be, I feel like unless Sprinkle is a, a unicorn coach that can recruit and develop and, and win at a high level. Uh, I feel like it's going to be one of the, we're going to be one of those programs that's really cyclical where we'll have some really good years yeah, and, right. and then we'll be, you know, middle of the pack to the bottom where we've been. Um, but it's, it's with somebody like Michigan state who for 25 ish years, 30 years has been, well, I guess not that far back, but um, how long has Izzo been there? Since no, 90s, you're right. That's exactly, that's yeah, exactly right. it. About, okay. Almost, no, yeah. Since 90, since 95, 96 season, yeah. his debut year. Um, they're, they're a perennial team. Yeah. Um, they're perennially in the tournament. Um, the closest thing I can, I can think of is maybe in Arizona where right. they're just always in the tournament, but the, the styles are so different. 
So uh, a team that's consistently successful, that's more physical than uh, teams in the conference, it's, it's going to be entertaining. Uh, it's going to be a really tough matchup for uh, for somebody like Washington. Do you, do you yeah, think and that, the physicality. I mean, that's a question about physicality. I mean, yep. do you think that's a big difference stylistically between the pack? I mean, we've always we always say that the Big Ten because we're like, oh, right, we're tough or whatever. Is that something that you think is accurate? That the Big Ten just from a physical standpoint compared to the Pac twelve? Oh yeah, yep. so it's no question. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. You have, and it's it's not it's not necessarily your five. It's the depth. Um, Washington specifically has had when they were good, they, I mean, Isaiah Stewart was as physical as you can get, yeah. you know, yep. and Washington still, st- still is playing. Yeah, Detroit, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and they've had physical players. Quincy Pondexter was physical. Who's the guy with the, yeah. um, with the Timberwolves right now? Um, uh, the, the, why am I spacing on his name? He was Isaiah Stewart's teammate. Mm, I'm blanking as well. He's a local kid. He one of he's one of the better defensive players in the NBA. Um, they've had really tough guys. Uh, um, I'm blanking on another guy's name that was uh, from Illinois that came to Washington. But but you're saying it's not it's not it's, it's the depth. The right? You have some guys, program, right? Yep. It, you have you have a couple of guys, but. Overall, the 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 toughness from one to twelve, uh, it's it's a matter of depth. Yeah. And and the and that I think the other thing too is in the Big Ten. And you know, it's funny us talking about this. Those of us of a certain age think that the current standard is patty cake <laughs> compared to what it was in yeah. the seventies and the eighties. And I think there's and even the nineties. I think there's validity to that you talked about Mateen Cleaves. The way those teams were able to play, you can't, it's been legislated out of the game. You can't play that way defensively anymore, you know, but, um, but even having said that, I think my perception is the difference is that it's night after night after night in the big 10. So it's not just, oh, Michigan state's going to lay the wood to us. It's Rutgers plays that way with physicality. Purdue plays that way. Wisconsin plays physically. You know, you see it over and over and over. And and that's what I think makes the 20 the 20 game conference slog tough to get through is that it, it really is an endurance test as much as anything else. I, I, I went to law school in San Francisco, so I did three years in your roughly your area of the country mm-hmm. had a lot of classmates who were alums from the various PAC schools. And so. I definitely had that impression. And in those days, I'm not sure whether you think it's still the case. That was also kind of the the perception in football as well, that the Pac-10 or Pac-12 was a finesse speed league. And when the Big Ten team struggled with them in Rose Bowls, which they used to do for a long time, the cliche was, well, the Pac-10 schools just ran by them. Um, but yeah. I, I don't know if that's still the case in in terms of of football, but I definitely get the sense it is in basketball. Well, that was the hope in the national championship for Husky fans this year. We thought we ran right past Michigan and uh, you had a lot of, you had a lot of fans in green and white for that game. I'll tell you that (laughs) it was very disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) For us us too. Cause we got to live with it. We really have to live with it. Yeah. That's got it. And they don't care enough about the, their three wins this season in the big 10. Right. In basketball. They don't care about that. So yeah, exactly. All right. Well, uh, before we go, obviously, I have to remind everyone to check out the Squeegee Squad at Grand Rapids. If you need your windows cleaned or your house cleaning, check out the Squeegee Squad. They do fantastic work. 15% off if you mention Final Four. We need your estimate. You can find that, of course, at the Final Fours on the schedule.com slash support. Also, Christian Brother Automotive, if you want to oil change, they have a spring special. You just mentioned hoops to them and you get $40 off your oil change, battery change, and uh, tire rotation. They also do a free courtesy inspection there. And also, they can do any sort of the work you need. It's the Christian Brothers Automotive and there are a number of branches in the Grand Rapids area. And finally, just a reminder too, that if you are a supporter, we're going to have a supporter dinner sometime in East Lansing this summer. And so if you still want to try and get into that, anyone who gives uh, more than $10 a month or more, which is the Dream on Green level or above on Patreon or through Substack, you can meet us in person and we're going to just hang out and eat pizza or something like that. So anyway, check it out. Uh, thanks again to Trevor Mueller from, from, uh, 
Now I've totally forgotten where you are. What's the name of your show? Fourth and Inches, right? Oh, Fourth and Inches, the Husky Podcast. The, yeah, you're looking to lost too. Like, I don't know what's this called. <laughs> this is a guy who is a brand new baby. So that's a, you, I, yeah. I appreciate you just being awake, right? During the middle of the day. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's always tough. This is the struggle we're going to have for us more so than you is that just the time for games is going to be really hard for us. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not looking forward to all those late time games trying to do our post game show. Anyway, that's our problem, not your problem. So, uh, again, thanks so much for coming on to the show. We really appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you for having me. So until next time, the final four is on the schedule. Go green.